Hello and welcome to lecture 72 of my course, From Data to Decisions. I'm Chris Mack, your instructor. In this lecture, I'll provide some final thoughts on our series of lectures on design experiments. We sometimes employ design of experiments in a sequential mode because we're often using design of experiments in an exploratory way. That is, uh, we don't really know what kind of a response we're going to see when we run our experiments. So we need to explore the design space, but we want to do it as efficiently as possible. Of course, if I knew the design space looked like this right here, then it would be easy, right? If I, if I had enough density of data that I could easily see all these contours pointing to the optimum, uh, life would be easy, right? But it takes way too much data to generate these very detailed contours in many circumstances I can afford all of that data. So we employ a design of experiments in order to determine what the shapes of these contours are like or to find where that optimum is trying to minimize the number of data points that we use. So we often begin as I've said before with a two-level screening experiment. Here I only have two variables, two Factors, temperature and concentration, <coughs> contours of constant yield process are shown here. And I perform a factorial design and I just pick uh, something usually centered about our current process. I have no idea whether I'm close to an optimum or far away from an optimum. But when I look at this factorial design, I see that the contours or the direction is, is pointing in a certain way. So I look at the direction of steepest descent, and I move from the middle of this design to a, 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 another point, and then I perform a, another uh, factorial design at this new point. I might also enhance that two-level factorial design by turning it into a composite, central composite design and perform response surface modeling. Well, that requires a couple of steps. First, it requires starting with that factorial design using then a linear model. So the linear model will point me in the right direction that I want to go. It's usually centered about our quote unquote plan of record, our, our standard existing process that we're trying to improve. Uh, or it's centered around our best guess of where we think uh, the process should be. We, we Scale all of our coordinates so that every variable zero at the center or at the plan of record. Then uh, I calculate the slopes for each of the coefficients x1 and x2. Um, I will then move in a direction of steepest descent. So if I have a bunch of factors, I look for the largest slope, the largest magnitude of, of beta. Um, in our model, let's suppose that's the jth factor, whatever that is. Then I'll move a distance delta xj equal to one from the center. Uh, maybe I'll move further or maybe less, depending on my judgment of the process and how far I think I should move on this first step. But uh, delta x of one is, is a pretty typical value. Then for every other factor, I'll move a distance uh, delta x equal to the amount I moved on that first step times the ratio of the slopes uh, of the new factor and the old, uh, the old maximum. Once I jump to this new point along the direction of steepest descent, I'll measure. I'll make a measurement at that point, and I'll see if things got better or worse. I keep moving along that same direction until things start getting worse, and I stop and perform uh, another design of experiments around this new point. This sequential DOA often involves beginning with a two-level full factorial design. I'll have some repeated center points to ensure uniformity. Then later I'll say, ah, I'm close enough to the optimum that I'll convert this two-level full factorial design into a quadratic uh, design using something like a central composite. And response surface modeling. 
Well, that results in two blocks of experiment. Remember, I did the two full, two level full factor, excuse me, the two level full factorial design first in one block. I analyze the data, I look at it, decide what to do next. Then I'll come back and add the um, star points, the axial points around. So that becomes a second block because they're separated in time. And something might have changed. I have to worry about whether or not there's any change in uh, the process that occurred. So I'll do heated center points for the second block as well as the first block. And then here's some, some rules of thumb, uh, some general rules about how many repeated center points I do in the center of the stars. Uh, for my response service modeling compared to the centers of the original factorial design. So if I'm going to add n centers at the star, I'll add n centers for the factorial repeats. If I have a two-factor design, if I have a four-factor design, I'll, I'll do twice as many in the factorial repeats and some other rules here. So we carefully adjust the number of center repeats to get the right statistical uniformity rotatability, orthogonality, et cetera, when we're using these essentially two blocks. All right, here's another miscellaneous topic I'll throw in. Sometimes we have factors with constraints. For example, mixtures. Suppose I'm mixing up uh, chemicals and I'm varying the weight percent of each of the materials. Well, every material's weight percent can only go from zero to one. And here's the constraint. The sum of all the weight percents has to be equal to one. All right, how do you design your experiment with this, is, with this being the case? You know, uh, they're not, all the factors are no longer independent of each other, like we assumed when we did full factorial designs or central composite designs, et cetera. Well, the method we use is called the simplex design. We divide up our, uh, each of the factors into m uh, segments. That produces m plus 1 evenly spaced points. For example, uh, three segments. Uh, that means each concentration could have a value of 0, 1 third, 2 thirds, or 1. So four different possibilities. Now I find all the combinations of all of the factors that are all evenly spaced, 0, 1 third, 2 thirds, and 1 so that every time it all adds up to one. Here's a graphical representation of what that would look like if I had three different components. I broke them up into three different levels. So component X1 can be 0, 1 third, thirds, and 1. X3 can be 0, 1 third, 2 thirds, and 1, etc. So what are my factors? I can make x1 equal to a concentration of one third, eight percent. Then I have two choices. I can make one one choice would be make x third equal to two thirds, or the other x3, or the other choice would be make x2 equal to two thirds. If x1 were two thirds, then I can make x3 of one third or x2. So you just follow these lines and you land along uh, the edge that tells you the concentration of X2. And of course, X3 would be, if I were here, along this line, I'd have X1 of 2 thirds, X2 of 2 thirds, and X3 of zero. And then there's a center point where they're all equal to a third. Uh, it's easy to do graphically in, the, in this case, but with more and more variables, uh, it gets more complicated to visualize. But the same basic design spirit is present. It's called the simplex design. All right, one more miscellaneous topic related to the design of experiments. You may run into the term Taguchi methods. You'll see a paper and someone says, I'm using the Taguchi method, and then what you see is design of experiments. Well, what is this Taguchi method and what does it mean? Well, it's basically a superset of design of experiments. It's statistical methods that are used mostly in manufacturing uh, to make sure that the quality is high and as high as possible. It's, it's a quality improvement 
technique. It's based on three concepts. First, that you need to do an optimization, and that optimization involves the use of a loss function. Now, there are three types of loss functions. If the answer is the more the better, for example, I'm trying to maximize uh, production output, I'll use a monotonic loss function where more is judged as better. If less is better, for example, I'm trying to minimize the amount of pollution that's generated uh, in, in a car, for example, then I'll also use a monotonic loss function, but of course operating in the other direction, trying to minimize. And if I'm trying to hit a target with the minimum variation, then I'll use a quadratic loss function. Uh, there's some more details about how to produce these loss functions involved. Um, the second concept is that quality begins by designing a process that inherently has high quality. In other words, you try to design a process where variations are at a minimum, not just hitting the target, but hitting the target with minimum variation. And then accomplish all of these things by using design of experiments, which is why often we'll see as I said, a design of experiments result being presented in the literature, and it will be explained as the Taguchi methods. Well, that's just because the Taguchi methods always employs design of experiments in its use, in its drive towards higher quality. All right, my last topic on design of experiments is some cautions. I have seen engineers use design of experiments correctly, but in a way that in fact makes them worse engineers and scientists, not better ones. Here's what I mean. I've seen engineers use design of experiments and especially response surface methods as a crutch to get an answer without learning, without understanding. In other words, I, I want to optimize my process. I set up a design of experiments. I run the experiments. I, my DOE, my response surface method, points to a minimum, and I move my process to that minimum, and I, I stop and I claim success. The problem with this is it's entirely an empirical uh, effort. I never ask why. Why is that the minimum? Why does moving in this direction make things better? I simply do it. Punch numbers, get an answer. I've optimized a process without any learning about that process going on. Then uh, another process comes along, or uh, uh, something changes about the process. I need to repeat this. I, I don't, I can't use any of my past experience to help me with the new problem. I'm simply doing another empirical problem. Uh, instead of thinking like a scientist, I've started thinking just like a statistician. Statistics is a tool, as I like to tell my students, you put on your statistics brain, don't turn off your science brain. Don't turn off your engineering brain. Your engineers and scientists first. Statistics is a tool. Use your statistics brain. But keep your science brain intact and always ask, why are things behaving this way? What can I learn? What does the model mean? What does it tell me? It's not just a mathematical tool the tool to help us understand the science. Also remember that design assumes a model. Every time we design an experiment, we start with assuming the model we want. Sometimes we assume an alternate model, but the design cannot exceed whatever that alternate model is. So if I, if I use a two-level full factorial model, I can't see anything but a linear trend. If I use a a uh, three factorial or a central composite design, something like that, then I can't see anything beyond quadratic behavior. There's no way to test for model error. There's no way to see whether or not that's a reasonable assumption. If I use a quadratic model, one of the benefits of the quadratic model is it always shows an optimum. But that's one of the detriments as well, because maybe there is no optimum. If you use a quadratic model, it will point to an optimum even if there isn't one. It will show you a minimum of my quadratic curve or a maximum of that curve. But where that maximum is is not just about 
the uncertainty in your measurements, the variation in your process, but also about the accuracy of the model. Since we're not checking the accuracy of the model, we don't know how certain those minimum points are. I'll give you an example in the next slide. If I have an exponential data where I'm moving closer and closer to the best I could ever do uh, continuously as I increase my uh, x variable. If I tried to use response surface modeling, I would find an optimal. Here's an example. Here's an exponential behavior with noise around that exponential behavior. Right? Uh, what's really happening here is things are, are approaching a maximum and then they're just leveling off. Out here it's basically level or it's getting closer and closer to a maximum, but within the noise I've leveled off. If, however, I perform response surfing mo surface modeling, I'll find that there's a maximum. And I'll say move to that maximum and I'll think, oh, I found the, the optimum process and if it's larger than that, I need to move it back or something like that. So it can mislead me into what the true behavior of this process is. And if you don't care what the true behavior is like, you don't want to learn anything about your process, then numerical result is the numerical result and you're done. But uh, I think the best engineers and scientists, ones I've worked with who have applied these methods, don't just stop with the answer that comes out the other end of their software. They ask the question why, they challenge their assumptions, they don't use design of experiments as a crutch, for not having to understand what's going on. All right, I still like design of experiments. It's a very valuable tool. Um, I, I just encourage you not to misuse it and to not turn off your science brain just because you engage your statistics brain. What have we learned in lecture 72? Explain sequential design of experiments. What is the simplex design and when is it used? Describe the Taguchi methods. And finally, what are some of the cautions I've told you about using design of experiments and response surface modeling? Well, we'll have one more lecture on the use of response surface modeling in R, and then we will be finished with our section on design of experiments. Moving on to other topics next. Well, then.